And so in another hadith, the Prophet swore by him in whose hand is my soul, this world will not go until it comes upon the people a day, لا يدر القاتل فيما قتل ولا المقتول فيما قتل until the one who is killed will not know why he has been killed and the one who is killing will not know why he's doing the killing. And we spoke about that yesterday in light of a few things. Number one, the connection between the altitude and the attitude. So it's, it's, it's not just for a specific people. In fact, everyone, anyone has this human capacity. The further we are away from human beings, the, the less empathy we have for them. Uh, and also, if there is a process of dehumanization, and we discussed that in light of the, uh, the Afro-Americans when they were taken, snatched uh, and enslaved in America and sold in slavery. We spoke about that in light of Vietnam and Japan, um, and also in light of what is happening now in Iraq and Afghanistan. These dehumanizing labels upon the people. Uh, essentially, in the world, there are those like Susan Sontag discusses in her book about the uh, suffering of other people. There are some people in the world who are seen and others who are to be seen. There are some people in the world who see, sorry, like us and others who are to be seen by us. And that is quite a remarkable way of looking at things because it's so true. There are some people in the world who see and others are just to be seen. Right? There are some who, are, who, who don't fit the image, who don't look the part. In fact, if you remember in Shakespeare's uh, play in The Tempest, what do you have? You have uh, uh, Trinculo who comes upon uh, Caliban. And uh, Caliban, who of course is a, is a wizard of some sort, but he's dark-skinned. So when Trinculo first comes upon him, he sees this dark-skinned person and he thinks he's a dead Indian. He thinks he's a dead Indian. And so he says, I will take this person back to England and I will... Uh, I will make people pay to see him. And he says, you know, where people won't even give one shilling to save a lame beggar, they'd lay out ten shillings to see a dead Indian. You know, because he's too dark-skinned. No one would ever want to have any dealings with him. The idea is he's, he fits the mold of people who are, who are to be seen. Just like you have proliferation of images of women in burqas, for example. It's as if they're dehumanized. They are not human like anybody else, but they're to be seen. Or you find people who look odd, or you find people who, are, who act uh, in their views uh, bizarrely, for example. Those kind of people are not people like who, are, who feel and who also see the world, but those are the people who are to be seen by the world. And this in fact is an obvious process of dehumanization, but we sometimes miss the mark. But it's so true. Take anything like this, prejudice, discrimination, racism, and you will find this in the mold of it all. The idea is, and we began to discuss yesterday, but we had to rush because there were so many things to go through. Um, I spoke briefly about what happened in 2007 with the Virginia Tech. And it is remarkable if you look at it just as an isolated example, because here you had that individual who killed these 30 odd people, and then he turned the gun upon himself and he killed himself. Now, what that was in American media, in fact, was a high point. It was called a high point in American media. Because American media dedicated to each and every person who was killed a, a quite a long segment in their reportage. So you learned, for example, who that one person was. You saw the person, you saw his, what his dreams were before he was killed, his hopes, his ambitions, you saw his mother weeping, you saw his siblings holding on to their mothers and their fathers, you even perhaps saw the burial. You see everything about the person to make that person a human being. He's humanized by way of that time that the media is allotted for him. And they give it for everyone, and it was long. Jeremy Scahill, in fact, says that in his analysis, if, if the American media gave that coverage to one day of what happens in Iraq on a daily basis, the war would end from his, from his analysis in the fact that people would immediately be drawn to humanize the people who so far are dehumanized. And the number of Muslims killed in Iraq on that day, specific particular day, was more than the number in Virginia Tech. But there are some people who see, and there are others who, who are to be seen. There are some images that are iconic images, and there are others that are not iconic. So you have in your mind, when you think of the word iconic, you have in your mind certain images, it's true. Like if you're in the, from the West, you've lived in the West, and you know that one of the most iconic images of effect of warfare, when you open the history textbooks, you see that poor Vietnamese girl running, right? 
Okay, everyone's seen. She's being skinned by American napalm. The poor Vietnamese girl is being skinned by American napalm. But the image is so iconic. Or you might think about the, uh, the boy after the Angelus, after the annexation of Austria, when the Nazis pointed the gun at his head and his mother's doing something, but we, can't, we don't know exactly. She's trying to pull him away or trying to do something, but the Nazis just pointing the gun at his head. But the image is just iconic. Or you might remember 1994, the Bosnian Muslims behind the Amarska barbed wire of Amarska concentration camp, right? You've seen the footage on ITN, 1994. Or it might be the Muslims from Guantanamo Bay, because the image is so iconic. And so there are some images that are iconic and unforgettable, because you've seen them so often. But each one of these person, people has uh, a sibling, each one has a mother, each one has a father, each one has neighbors, relatives. So the ghulam does not exist in isolation, but it extends to all. When the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, اِتَّقُوا ظُلَمْ فَإِنَّ ظُلَمْ ظُلَمَاتٌ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ Beware of ظُلَمْ, beware of injustice, because that is darknesses, plural, on the Day of Judgment. It isn't simply one, it is a lot. ظُلْم عَدَمَ النُّورِ فِي مَا شَأْنُ وَنْيَسْتَنِيرِ it is darknesses, it is the removal of light where light should exist, and it's ظلم. It's putting a thing in a position where it should not be. It's both. But it's about how far we extend it. How far do we extend it? You know, it's an amazing thing, the way that the heart works, and how we can show human empathy. But if we don't even know the narrative, then we, we lose all the feelings. So from the perspective we discussed, of the very national level of people like gangsters and people who have no regard, they have this kind of propensity to kill, or at least they think they have the human propensity only to kill. And so they go and they gun down people and they stab other people. You know, there was a case of Penn, I remember the case of Ben Kinzella, you wouldn't remember, no, perhaps I remember, but in England, you know, a, a boy who was stabbed for his cap, and his mother just bought his cap on his birthday, and I think it was his birthday day, if I, if I remember. And he was wearing the cap and so some thugs came along on their bikes and says, you know, with the knife, give us the cap. And he happily gave the cap, but they still stabbed him, right? And there are people who, you know, in the, one of the most, most iconic cases, inshallah, I try and be here on Thursday, because I will go through the narrative of Hussein ibn Ali, radiallahu ta'ala an, and his killing, and how that connects to what we call the bystander effect. Um, but one of the most uh, talked about cases is the case of a woman called Kitty Genovese in 1964 or 65. Uh, but the killer simply said, I killed her because I wanted to know what it felt like to kill a woman. Do you think the woman understood your logic? Understood the rationale? No. The one who kills will not know why he's killing, and the one who is killed will not know why he has been killed. And also, from the perspective then of international crime, we take the uh, hostile militaries of some countries who kill people indiscriminately. But because of the altitude, there is no feeling. They feel nothing. Read the reports. They feel absolutely nothing. They just go back to Starbucks to drink their coffee. But if you gave that person in the high altitude a knife, or if he was given a knife or a gun, so go back down to earth and don't kill a hundred or a thousand people, and along with that the wildlife and the, the, the cows and the sheep and blow up the well and blow up the school and blow up the masjid and everything else, forget all of that, just take one weapon, go down back to earth, find one person and point the gun at him, and then see if you can do it. Now it's different. Because that person now, there is a a frame within which there are three phases. The first phase is the person has to have the conscience to point the gun at someone else's face. The guy is innocent, hasn't done anything, and you will see the person uh, begging for clemency and mercy. Please don't kill me because my mother is sick and needs my help. If the guy decides to pull the trigger, then the person falls down on the floor and the uh, decimation, the mess, the blood is now on that person. Right? And that's the second thing. He has to deal with it. And number three, the person who is still on the floor begging for help, go and call an ambulance or do something. Right? So to, to kind of pass through these three phases will make the person uh, 
be able to do his crime, but from the altitude, press a button, and there's absolutely no feeling to that. And so we discussed that.